group of real experts on the subject that uh, I'm looking forward to, um, to hearing. Um, this is part of an ongoing series that the Scholl Chair has done on advanced technologies in various forms. We did one on, on blockchain uh, earlier. We did one on uh, uh, 3D printing. And this one is going to be related to advanced technologies in automobiles. This one in particular, I think, is, is going to uh, uh, be important because autos and auto parts are such an important component of our international trade. They, and the industry is such an important part of our economy. Directly and indirectly, they account for nearly 10 million jobs in all 50 states, 5% of private sector employment. They're the largest manufacturing sector in the United States. 13 companies, two of which are on our panel, operate 44 plants in 14 states. Exports total over $97 billion last year. 17% uh, of all of our exports come from this sector, and that's nearly double the value that they were 15 years ago. So it's been an area of dramatic growth. It's the biggest item of two-way trade in uh, our, some of our major trading partners, Canada, Mexico, and the EU in particular. We're doing this also because I think big changes are on the way, and that's some of the things that you'll be hearing about. Alternative fuel sources, uh, electric, but not only electric, application of artificial intelligence uh, to the automobiles and the development, of course, of autonomous vehicles. So there's a lot going on to make changes in the sector that in turn will make changes in supply chains and, and keep people focused uh, on this sector for quite some time going forward. We're going to be looking at all these developments um, if, uh, if, uh, we're going to be researching all these developments here at CSIS, ultimately producing a paper on the subject um, later this year. And we're going to be asking, and hopefully answering, uh, questions like, is the U.S. in the lead in developing advanced automobiles? Uh, should we be? Does it matter if we're not? Uh, if we're not, do we need to get into the lead? What are we doing right? And what are the obstacles that are in the way of that? Relevant, and particularly relevant to our panel, is to ask the old uh, Robert Reich question, who is us? Is us only U.S. companies? Or is us including companies that have uh, foreign headquarters, uh, two of which are on our panel, and both of which, among others, have a substantial physical presence in the United States and substantial investment in R&D. In fact, I noticed just today I was looking at uh, some press accounts, and Toyota just announced an, an additional $391 million investment in San Antonio uh, to build uh, next generation pickup trucks uh, using other using new advanced technologies. So the foreign presence in the United States has been significant in this sector for a long time, and it continues to grow. But the question of who is us uh, remains. Uh, what is our government's policy in all this? What does the government want to accomplish in this sector? Uh, and is it using the appropriate tools to get there? Do we want, do we need more investment in this sector? And if so, how do we encourage that? So we're not going to answer all these questions today, but we're going to discuss some of them. Uh, of course, if we did answer them all today, there'd be no point in doing the paper that we're, that we're launching. So uh, we, we're going to use this as a start and going to use the, uh, the really good uh, thoughts that we're going to get from the panel uh, to launch uh, our inquiry. And then we'll be back to all of you and anybody else that's interested later on when we are finished and we can present what we've, the conclusions that we've come to. So we're going to begin today um, uh, with a representative of the administration, which we're very fortunate to have. Uh, and uh, his name is Shijish Kurup, who is a transportation policy specialist at the U.S. DOT, uh, Office of the Undersecretary for Policy, focused on emerging transportation technologies such as automation, connectivity, and cybersecurity, which is one I didn't mention. Sujish is also detailed to the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy as a policy analyst focused exclusively on surface on-road automated vehicles. So if there's anybody in the United States government that knows what they're doing and what's going on, it's he. 
and we're particularly glad that he was able to join us today. He's going to make some opening remarks, and then he's going to join the panel, uh, and we'll have kind of a conversation about it, after which we'll turn it over to you all for, for Q&A. The panel uh, is going to be moderated by Gabriel Coppola, or is it Coppola? Coppola. Coppola, sorry, well. Uh, I knew I was going to get something wrong. Uh, Gabby is a business and economics reporter living in Detroit. She currently covers the auto industry for Bloomberg News. She pre previously wrote about Israeli technology for Bloomberg, pursuing an interest in the intersection of technology, labor, and the future of work, all things that we've been working on here as well. As a foreign correspondent in Sao Paulo, Brazil, she followed the country's experiments with state-led capitalism. Before that, she covered the meltdown of U.S. credit markets in the 2008 financial crisis. Her work has appeared in Bloomberg Business Week, Bloomberg Markets Magazine, CNN Money, and the Wall Street Journal. And we're delighted that Gabby was willing to join us to moderate the panel. So the way we're going to proceed is I'm going to go away. Well, I'm not going to go away. I'm going to go sit in the front row. Uh, Sujish is going to come up and uh, make some opening remarks. And then uh, he's going to be joined by the panel. And Gabby will start the conversation. So it's all yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sujish Kurup. I have the privilege of representing both the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and the Department of Transportation. Today, I want to provide a high-level overview of some of the relevant surface automated vehicle initiatives the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and the Department of Transportation has going on to prepare for the future of surface transportation. Additionally, I would also like to highlight some of the key reasons why the United States attracts so many AV innovators. In September 2017, the Department of Transportation released the Automated Driving Systems 2.0, a vision for safety. We call it AD ADS 2.0. ADS 2.0 provides voluntary guidance to the industry, as well as technical assistance to um, technical assistance and best practices to states, and offers a path forward for safe testing and integration of ADS. ADS 2.0 focuses on guidance on SAE automation level three and above automated driving systems, makes clear the voluntary nature of the safety self-assessment, we call it VSSAs. It revises priority safety elements on the 12 aspects that are ready to implementation in the near term. ADS 2.0 also provides best practices for state legislations. ADS 2.0 encourages the public disclosure of VSSAs. So far, there's been 16 VSSAs published by ADS developers. In October 2018, uh, DOT released Preparing for the Future of Transportation Automated Vehicle 3.0. We call it AV 3.0. AV 3.0 introduces guiding principles for AV innovations and describes the department's comprehensive implementation strategies to address existing barriers to potential safety benefits and progress. AV 3.0 provides multimodal safety guidance from NHTSA, Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit Administration, Federal Motor Carrier Administration, Federal Transit Administration, Federal Rail Administration, Maritime Administration, and uh, Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration. AV 3.0 describes the illustrative framework of safety risk management stages to full commercial integration of automated vehicles. AV 3.0 clarifies policy and roles, such as it interprets the definition of a driver and operator to recognize that such terms do not exclusively refer to humans, but may also include automated systems. AV 3.0 urges states and, local, uh, states and localities to work to remove barriers, such as unnecessary and incompatible regulations, to automated vehicle technologies to support interoperability. A AV 3.0 affirms USDOT's authorities to establish motor vehicle safety standards that allow innovative automated vehicle des designs and notes that such an approach may require a more fundamental revamping of NHTSA's approach to safety standards for application to automated vehicles. AV3.0 AV reaffirms USDOT's reliance on self-certification approach rather than type approval as a way to balance and promote safety and innovation. USDOT will continue to adv advance this approach with our international community. Additionally, AV3.0 outlines how to work with DOT as automation technology evolves. The White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, under the leadership of United States Chief Technology Officer Michael Kratzios, is currently developing the Federal Strategy for Automated Vehicles. The Federal Strategy for Automated Vehicles intends to provide AV innovators a one-stop shop to most or if all the limited available federal resources and highlights the benefits of developing AV technology in the United States. One of the things we'll be discussing during our panel today is how did the United States foster such a healthy environment for AV R&D and other complementary investments. We believe there are various factors for this, but I would like to highlight some of the key factors. 
Number one, U.S. has a flexible safety regulatory framework. Unlike most countries, U.S. has a safety framework that allows AV innovators to have access to U.S. marketplace without excessive regulatory burden. Additionally, AV innovators have the opportunity to test experimental vehicles in the U.S. public roads. Through our approach, we believe we'll allow innovation to continue while ensuring safety. Number two, in U.S., AV innovators have the opportunity to access academia, federal, and industry partnership. Some of the world's leading academic institutions that specialize in AI, robotics, quantum, propulsion systems, electronics and communication technologies, and other institutional expertise needed to develop next generation vehicles and its underlying technologies are located in the United States. Additionally, United States government has historically promoted innovations through grant challenges and grants that promote collaboration and innovation with academia and collaborative partnerships. Some of the examples are the DARPA 2004-2007 Grand Challenge, uh, USDOT 2019 Automated Driving System Grants for $60, $60 million, uh, DOE's 2016 ARPA-E $32 million grants, and there are many more like examples like this. Furthermore, select fundamental research that is conducted by our national labs and other federal researchers are available for academia and, tech, uh, and industry for technology transfer. This vast set of research is available through the Federal Laboratory Consortium for Technology Transfer for the use for industry and academia. Number three, U.S. has an attractive tax incentives for R&D. The Department of Treasury and the Internal Revenue Service publish administrative rules and other guidance on current federal income tax law incentives. Taxpayers can immediately expense costs in R&D activities that are experimental in nature with purpose of eliminating uncertainty while developing or improving a product. There are various qualifying items, qualifying items for R&D tax incentives. The Department of Treasury and the IRS are here to help you if you want to learn more about these potential tax incentives. Number four, U.S. provides intellectual, pro uh, intellectual property protections. U.S. IP protections are conducted through a three-pronged approach. We deliver high quality and timely examination of patents and trademark applications. Uh, we guide domestic and international IP policy, and we deliver IP information and education worldwide. We believe a combination of these factors, and there are many more factors that, that, are, that are the key that makes United States such a, uh, United States foster such a healthy environment for AV, R&D, and other complementary investments in the United States. The White House Office on Science and Technology Policy, the Department of Transportation, and the federal government is doing many interesting things in the sector in, in automated vehicles and complementary technologies. I'm happy to discuss uh, this topic further with our through our discussion. I look forward to the panel discussion on this topic uh, with our moderator and our distinguished panel. Um, thank you. which is recognized as the world's top think tank for science and tech policy. He's the author of three books, including Big is Beautiful, Debunking the Mythology of Small Business and Innovation Economics, The Race for Global Advantage, and The Past and Future of America's Economy, Long Waves of Innovation that Power Cycles of Growth. He's conducted groundbreaking research projects and authored hundreds of articles and reports on technology and innovation related topics ranging from tax policy to advanced manufacturing, productivity, and global competitiveness. He's testified before the U.S. Congress more than 30 times and was appointed by Presidents Clinton, Bush, Obama to advise on issues touching on economic change in the new economy, transportation, infrastructure, innovation, and competitiveness. competitiveness excuse me. And there's a lot more, but I thought I would just cut off there. Um, then we've also got Bruce Belzowski, second to last on the end there. Bruce is the managing director of the Automotive Futures Group, which is a research group based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He spent 25 years studying the global auto industry, focusing on topics including product development, 
manufacturer, supplier, dealer relations, globalization, information technology, knowledge management, and human resources. His research topics at Automotive Futures include intelligent transportation systems, powertrain strategies, and globalization of the auto industry. He received his BA and MA from the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of Michigan, respectively. On the end, we've got David Genacopoulos. He's the Senior Executive Vice President for Public Affairs and Public Policy at the Volkswagen Group of America. He joined VW in 2003. And prior to being named to his current position, he served as the Executive Vice President for Public Affairs and General Counsel at VW, which is the world's largest automaker. He also was a partner at the firm of Aiken, Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld in Washington. He also serves on the board of directors of the Center for National Policy and the Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers. Okay, and then we've got um, get everybody. Okay, so Jishui No, and then Jeff uh, Makarowitz. He is the Group Vice President of Advanced Mobility R&D at Toyota Motor Corp of North America. Prior to that, he led vehicle quality and safety engineering for Toyota, where he was responsible for vehicle performance, safety research, materials engineering, and quality promotion. He joined Toyota Motor North America in 1990 as an engineer in the materials engineering department and has held various positions in materials research, product development, corporate strategy, quality promotion, and vehicle performance. He sits on the board of the Toyota Foundation, the Michigan Alliance for Greater Mobility Advancement, and the University of Michigan's Mechanical Engineering External Advisory Board. He earned his degree from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Okay. Um, so I think uh, Sujish gave us a good introduction. I think the basic premise here we're looking at is, is the United States the premier place for R&D for next generation vehicles? So do you agree with that? And what do we need to do to maintain that position if you do think so? And um, anyone, maybe Bob wants to jump in or anybody? Uh, sure, I do, I do believe that. Uh, I mean, I think if one way to think about this industry is it's evolving from an atom-based industry to a bits and atom-based industry. So uh, there's always been electronics in cars. If you ever fix an old car with, a, with points, you know, you'd, they're essentially sort of electromechanical, and now it's all electrical and increasingly software. Um, there's a great stat that I had in this. We, by the way, ITF, we released a report last year called How the Shift to IT-Enabled Vehicles Plays to America's Competitive Strengths. And uh, the, today, a typical automobile has more than 100 million lines of software code, which is more than uh, the Microsoft uh, Vista operating system did 10 years ago. So if you think about comparing Europe to the US, you know, we won, essentially. <laughs> Uh, you know, we won the internet era. We built the major firms. They've got a few, SAP and a couple of those, but we won. And, and Europe didn't. And they're sort of facing this existential crisis now, which comes out through various means and various measures. But the reason we won was because the last innovation wave was around the internet and around software. And we just happened to be the best. And I don't mean to be, you know, you know, Ray, you know, Ray and Mary, you know, we just happen to be the best at that. We have the best software system and, and engineers and, and universities in the world. And I think that's why the Europeans are so uh, frustrated and paranoid right now and worried is because as we move many industries, including transportation and aut uh, automobiles in particular, more to a software-driven industry, it plays to the U.S. strength. So, uh, for Europe, they, they're gonna, they, they have sort of two challenges. They just have simply fewer software engineers as a share of their workforce than we do. Their universities, while good, are not as good as ours. And then the third challenge the Europeans have that we don't have, and, and you mentioned this, is we have a better regulatory environment. We, we don't adopt the precautionary principle. I was talking to one European official recently, and they said, well, look, the way we look at it is we're going to let you go first with, a, with uh, autonomous vehicle regulations, and then you'll make a lot of mistakes, and a few people will die, and then, and then we'll come in afterwards. And I said, well, that would work in the old economy, but it doesn't work in a first mover economy where first mover, first mover advantage really matters. So those are the strengths we have, and I think they're important, and we need to build on those. I think the real wild card is China, because China is also super good at software. They've got scale, which is really important in the industry. Uh, they have acquisition of foreign technologies through both good and ill, me unfair means. And also importantly for China, they have a boatload of subsidies. I mean, just massive amounts of subsidies that they're going to pour into this 
Um, so what I worry about is that they're going to get to scale faster than we are. So I think our couple, just a couple things I think. Number one, we need to do a better job of funding our university research where uh, we're now probably, according to the OECD numbers for a new report we have coming out, we rank uh, something like 30th. Uh, the numbers, I can tell you in about three weeks exactly, but we're essentially 30th in the world now in funding university research as a share of GDP. Uh, that's pretty pitiful, uh, given America's long tradition as the leader. That's how far we've fallen. Um, so we need to do more there. Uh, a lot of this talent that's going to be able to be building and integrating mechanical engineering and electrical and software is going to be foreign. And so we have to do a better job of attracting and retaining and, and, and getting the best talent in the world. And then finally, we need the right regulatory system, which I give the Trump administration an enormous amount of credit for doing that through DOT. But again, if you look at Congress, this is my last point, you know, when they debated, the Senate debated the autonomous vehicles bill, they exempted trucks uh, in their version. Uh, obvious why, you know, the trucking union, the Teamsters didn't want to see autonomous vehicles. And I think it's really important for us to not go down the road of fear of technology, of this technology, and, and sort of a protectionist, Luddite kind of approach to it. We've got to put all pedal to the metal, to use a pun here, to move forward if we're going to win. Uh, thanks, Gabby. Uh, I agree with uh, the factors that Bob has stated about why the uh, U.S. is the premier place for R&D in uh, autonomous vehicles. A couple of points that I would add are that uh, we have a tremendous interest from our venture capital community and therefore a lot of resources being invested here in the country. I think we have also the tremendous capacity of our industry. We've got every major car company in the world investing tens and hundreds of millions of dollars in research and development in this area in the United States. At Volkswagen, we have our engineering center in California that does work on robotics and autonomous vehicles, especially when it comes to adaptation of vehicles for disabled persons looking toward the future for level five cars. And then we have this tremendous uh, coterie of uh, universities that Bob alluded to with University of Michigan, MIT, Stanford, where a lot of our talent in Silicon Valley has come from over the years. Uh, and Carnegie Mellon, and you can't overstate the University of Michigan. <laughs> so uh, I think capacity is another big factor to go with investment. And uh, one last note to echo what Bob said on the regulatory environment. We have more freedom and flexibility in our regulatory framework, but we also have a need to really get it going. You know, we still have some confusion about the difference in the federal role and the state role in this area, um, some of which um, as a, as a uh, lawyer or a reformed lawyer, I would take a too deep dive on. But um, I think that's an important area for further progress to be made. And uh, we look forward to working with uh, the administration and all the agencies to, to keep moving that in the right direction. And, and if I could just briefly add, so without a doubt, the U.S. is still the premier uh, place to do research, which is why for the last 45 years, Toyota has been growing our R&D footprint here. Uh, with campuses in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Saline, Michigan, Mountain View, California, Torrance, California, Whitman, Arizona. Later this week, we'll be announcing a new office we're opening in Pittsburgh. Um, in addition to core R&D, we've established the Toyota Research Institute with campuses on MIT and Stanford and the University of Michigan with a $1 billion uh, initial budget. We've established, and this is our global um, uh, organization responsible for our aut automated vehicles, machine learning, uh, AI, all of these factors. Uh, we've established our global hub for data management and data analytics in Plano, Texas, again, so that we could tap into the expertise. So I agree with the, uh, the, the prior panelists in, in terms of some of the, the means and what's enabling this, but I'd also add, I think a lot has to do with the, the policy and the um, enablers allowing us to, to collaborate and, and really um, see, see value in the research in terms of advancing, uh, working with industry, working with uh, startup companies, uh, and having that ability to partnership is extremely important. Um, well, I think, you know, the originally I think what Bob said was we're thinking about it at the sort of national level of U.S., Europe, China, but it's also clear that there are a lot of international partnerships happening, um, whether it's investment here in the U.S. or um, just when I think about the auto industry as a whole, it seems that there's a real need to collaborate because the actual task of investing in automated vehicles is so massive <clears throat> that, you know, no one company can sort of take it on alone. So I guess I'm just wondering, um, 
what role is trade playing and you know trade relations playing in forging those alliances? Is it you know sort of um, what is training? Trade, trade, just sort of you know the trade environment, things like that, um, or what are the, maybe what are the conditions that are enabling that to happen, or you know what what's driving that in terms of forging those alliances? You know, doing the investment that you're doing or. So we've been, we've been following the, the alliances that have been going on and the research cooperation that's going on between the manufacturers, sometimes usually with their suppliers, but also with each other, uh, especially in AVs that we're, that we're looking at right now. We really see this as the uh, beginnings of the, uh, of, a, of the new technology. Uh, almost one could argue in its, in, in its infancy. Uh, so it, you're, you're not really competing against each other at this stage because no one has a secret sauce for AVs yet. So we're still working on figuring out how, what's the best way to do this. Uh, one of the points that, that Bob made I thought was really good in particular about it, the U.S. is that the, the focus is on, it can be at the state level. It doesn't have to be at necessarily at the federal level. And it really has opened things up for AV testing at the state level, whereas in many other countries, you actually have to get the buy-in from the everything, everybody else in the country before you actually can do anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, and I will say certain states are better than other states. So for example, in the state of Michigan, um, the government really reached out to partner with us. They established a committee, an advisory committee, where uh, industry could provide input into what's necessary to, to foster and, and incubate certain advanced and emerging technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, they've also created, as everyone knows, it's going to require a lot of testing. Um, automated vehicles require in-lab modeling and simulation, uh, closed track testing, and public road testing. And the state was very forward thinking when it came to uh, providing opportunity and legislation to test vehicles on public roads. Uh, responsibly, uh, and then they also invested in close track, uh, like uh, M City and the American Center for Mobility, to, to partner with automakers and give us a place to uh, to test and evaluate. Mm -hmm. uh, but with that said, we have to keep in mind the auto industry is global. Um, you know, in Toyota's case, we sell vehicles in 170 different countries. We manufacture in 28 different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, here in the U.S., we export to 32 different countries. So we have to be able to to share technology and export this technology in order to, to, to commonize and leverage that. And so we start talking about you know, whether it's a trade or we start talking about export control regulations, we have to be mindful that anything applied too broadly or anything that's non-targeted could have negative impact in, in terms of us being able to invest in the future and, and apply this technology globally. Mm -hmm. okay. um, when it comes to the uh, partnerships that have been announced and that are developing, I think uh, it's, it's a sign that everybody's realized that uh, they can't do it on their own. And it's not just car companies and tech companies, it's, um, it's uh, other stakeholders that, that we need all to be working together in this area. So for example, Volkswagen has a partnership with Ford and Argo in this space that's analogous to one that Toyota has and another that GM has. And we'll all be, you know, trying to develop the best solutions, but none of us may have the, the you know, the secret sauce, as, as Bruce said, in the end. So we all need to be working hard at this. I think the competition supports innovation and helps drive us toward the right result. But while we're focusing on the technology, it's really important to look also at all of the other stakeholders' role. We've got to have public acceptance, consumer acceptance. We've got to have the, the regulatory and legal framework lined up. And we really have to make sure that uh, society is ready for this as well as we are with technology, plus the infrastructure side of things. So that's one, one among many reasons why with our colleagues at Toyota and the National Safety Council and others, we have been uh, promoting and supporting the uh, PAVE, the uh, Partnership for Autonomous Vehicle Education. And this is really, it, it, it's an education program in one respect, but it's also a vital source of input and intelligence for us as we do our work. If I can jump in on that point of collaboration, I think it's very important. I think no one entity can actually solve this problem. It has to be a collaborative effort between uh, OEMs to OEMs, OEMs to the automated uh, developers, and then states and localities. So DOT recognizes this. So in, in, uh, we announced a new sort of funding opportunity back in December uh, for $60 million in automated, uh, demonstra uh, automated driving system grants. And one of the key requirements was collaboration, that you had to show that you were collaborating not just with another company to obtain the vehicle, but also with the state and local government so that 
you can learn from each other and kind of make that data public to show the best practices on how do you collaborate. Because there is no silver bullet to this answer just yet, but we have to learn through uh, grants and all these other programs to learn about how best to collaborate, what are the best practices. And like you mentioned, it, I, I believe it is at its infancy that uh, you know, a lot of the systems that you see out there are driver assist systems. Uh, there's not a lot of self-driving cars out there that you can procure. They're all in R&D stages right now. So uh, you know, premature regulations or overstepping that, it actually inhibits innovation. So we want to make sure we learn with industry and states and local governments on how best to collaborate and what is that right touch. So we're trying to balance that and making sure at the same time we ensure safety. Just quickly add also, I think the issue we should, we should make sure we think about this at, at a broad enough level. Uh, the issue of the technology is really autonomy. It, it's not just cars. And so I think the U.S. should describe, uh, strive for global leadership on autonomous systems. So and we're going to move towards, hopefully, uh, autonomous trains. The DOT actually just removed, I think, an onerous regulation that would require two engineers or an engineer and a conductor in trains, which in theory you don't need if the technology is good enough. Ultimately, you go to one. There are trains in Australia with no drivers, essentially. Uh, but, you know, things like mining vehicles, uh, uh, think, uh, you know, forklifts in, in warehouses, uh, buses on can college campuses, a whole set of things that are going to be autonomous. And the technology is not like you're using just car autonomous systems. There's overlap. And I think we should be thinking the more we can build that overall ecosystem in the U.S., the better off our car companies will be who, who are here. Okay. What is the, um, can any of you speak to sort of the power dynamic between tech companies and auto companies? Because there is a lot of, you know, there's Google, Waymo, um, a lot of car companies have gone and acquired, you know, tech startups to kind of get that really high level technology. Um, that feels like a constant sort of push and pull as I cover the beat. So I'm just wondering how you see that. And I don't know what implications that has for our competitiveness as a country, but just what is the power dynamic like in these partnerships. I mean, I think Bruce said nobody has a secret sauce yet, but. Yeah, we really don't see the, this as being a, a big challenge for the auto industry in terms of these companies wanting to take over the car companies. Uh, the margins they get on, on their companies are so much better than that they, what, they, what they get in the, in the auto industry that it really doesn't behoove them to really say, oh, this is something I really want to invest in and increase all the headaches that, and all the safety regulations and all the things that go into being auto manufacturers. It's, it's a tremendous challenge for, for anybody. And it's, it, do, it doesn't, just doesn't seem like anything that would be of value to them in terms of, of overall. Of course, they'll provide the technology to support what, you know, the uh, autonomous vehicles or whatever other technology is, is that they're looking for. But uh, it's really not something that we really, I don't see the industry kind of worried about them doing this. So, so I, don't know, I was just out at the Uber uh, autonomous vehicle facility in San Francisco, which is pretty fascinating. They have a partnership with Volvo. Volvo builds the cars and they put the, or maybe they collectively they put the autonomy into it. Uh, so I 100% agree, they're not going to be banging metal, but, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, you, I, I don't know enough to say, but you could imagine Google or you know, Waymo or, or Uber developing some kinds of patented, you know, proprietary systems that then they sell to everybody. Then they become automotive suppliers. Sure, but, it, but it, the question is, you know, do you want to be IBM or do you want to be Microsoft back in, uh, mm. you know, whatever that, what was that, uh, in the early 1980s? Uh, you want to be Microsoft, and that's the question, I think, it's on the table. It, it is, can be, it yeah. can be, yeah. But there also has this issue of this metal bending is not, is not simple. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> totally. You know, when you I have, totally agree, they're not going to do it. You have 30,000 30, components that go into a vehicle. Fewer, probably, if you go to electric, uh, but then you've got autonomy coming in with new, new technology. Uh, uh, it's not something for the, for the faint of heart, that's for sure. But also, I mean, I'm just quick, that is another reason why we're doing so well. We have both our auto companies and our tech companies playing in this space, which is a really important a part. Absolutely, and I think the advantage that the auto companies have is you know, years and years of experience of how to integrate this technology mm -hmm. and deploy it in a safe manner. You know, software crashes, you just reboot. A car crashes, it's a big issue. So, the different mentality when it comes to, to the deployment of strategy. But I think what will be interesting is how the software is used and whose mm -hmm. software is used moving yeah. forward. Mm -hmm. Will it come from a tech company or will it come from the OEM? Mm -hmm. Or would it be a combination, kind of a, a joint venture or collaborative effort? So, I think sure. that's still to play out. Yeah. 
I agree with this, Jeff. We, we have a, a big internal investment in software uh, development in our company worldwide, and we've decoupled it from the product development process because those cycles are uh, so much different in their pace. Uh, at the same time, you know, we need the agility of these external partners that we have, and they need us. So I think to answer your question again, Gabby, the, uh, the balance is actually pretty close. Uh, you know, we need each other. Uh, in some cases, they're very large companies making partnerships with smaller companies that need the uh, support in order to, to develop and, and continue. And in our case, you know, although we develop our internal capacities, we also need to gain knowledge and, uh, and input from them. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's quite balanced. And, uh, you know, when you see the announcements, everybody's up there on stage together. It's not uh, a quiet acquisition. It's, uh, you know, a, it, it's a win for both sides. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we're all talking about self-driving software here, but of course, I think the other kind of term that always goes along with this trend is electrification and electric cars. Um, so, uh, you know, this is obviously, um, we're in the midst of a big sort of national debate about um, what our electrification strategy is. And I'm wondering, you know, it, we, I think it's clear that we are a hub of R&D for the automotive sector and tech and all those things. Does it matter, uh, you know, when it comes to what we require in terms of EVs and things like that? Are we at risk of ceding our leadership if we're not, you know, pushing EVs harder? So from, from an R&D perspective, when, when Toyota defines uh, electrification, we look at anything that runs on electrons. So plug-in hybrid, um, a battery electric hybrid could be hydrogen fuel cell um, or conventional hybrid. And uh, we're very proud of our, our leadership role. I think if, as you look at electrification, we've sold more electrified vehicles than the rest of the industry combined. Um, but the point I want to make is it's easy to conflate the difference between kind of market uptake and uh, R&D. You know, from our perspective, it takes the same amount of R&D to sell 1,000 vehicles as it does to sell 100,000 vehicles. So I think what really, and the reason I bring this up is, you know, every region is going to be a little bit different, but the R&D, we're all global companies, the R&D has to be done. Mm -hmm. So our philosophy is to bring the right vehicle to the right place at the right time. So when the U.S. is ready, when the market is, is, is pushing for, for electrification, <coughs> more electrification beyond conventional hybrids, we'll be ready and have product in the, in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. We're making a big bet on the electrification at Volkswagen, and uh, between now and 2023, we'll have invested f over 50 billion in electrification and advanced mobility. And uh, as a part of that, we announced in, in January at the Detroit Auto Show that we're investing 800 million in our factory in Chattanooga <coughs> in order to build a new line of electric cars there. And uh, so we're, we're, we're uh, certainly uh, uh, anticipating that there will be a increasing demand for EVs, and uh, we want to help promote that. So we're also making investments in infrastructure. Uh, this, this all has to come along uh, side by side, as, as, as Jeff makes clear. Uh, but at the same time, we're bullish on EVs. We think it's uh, the way to achieve the emissions redu reductions that we need to achieve in the future. And that uh, the technology is there and will get better and cheaper as we go. So a lot of investment, a lot of excitement, and. Uh, the next thing that you'll see from Volkswagen is the, um, in 2020, we'll introduce a new uh, uh, electric vehicle in the U.S. market that will uh, be called the ID Cross, and that'll be uh, eventually built in the line in Chattanooga when we're finished. We've just announced also a, an SUV on the Audi uh, brand that uh, is called the uh, e-tron, and these, that, that car has been very well received. So we're, we're excited about this development. Abby, Gabby, when it comes to the, uh, the EV, though, it's especially from a U.S. perspective, uh, you, you, uh, you can get worried about the battery story. Because when you look at, th there's R&D, of course, being done on, on batteries. But really, the, the major battery makers in, in the U.S. come from Korea, and they come from Japan, and they come from China. Uh, and now Tesla is beginning to start doing their own batteries. But that, they're really in early stages of this. Uh, in, in some ways, we've al almost already seated in, in this, well, I guess you would call it the infancy stage of electric vehicles. Uh, we've kind of seated that, that, uh, uh, that R&D and that capability uh, to foreign countries at this point. It's really something I think that, that the industry is, obviously, the industry is very aware of this. Uh, 
but it's something that I'm not sure that, that the government is, a, is, a, is aware of. I, I would just add to that. I mean, if you think about sort of looking at history, competitive shifts either in an industry or between regions or nations uh, more often occur when you have big technology shifts. Uh, it's not like you're, you're in a particular technology like internal combustion engines. These things are gradual shifts. When you go from one to another, that's where you can get disruptive shifts. And I look at this industry, I 100% agree with you. We, we've missed the battery boat. Um, you look at what the Chinese are doing. They have, they have a battery institute, an R&D battery institute. That's their two big battery companies are cooperating with a, with a bunch of u universities. And then right next to it is a massively subsidized, I mean, massively government subsidized battery factory. And then on top of that, you know, I, I would be sort of happy to believe that if it was sort of markets driving things that, you know, somebody would win, you might win, you might win, you know, GM might win. Uh, but but I, I, when you don't have the markets driving it, which is not what's going on in China, the markets are not driving this. The government has a thumb or driving, and they're turning the wheel super strong and saying, we are going to, you're going to, if you want to drive in China and you're driving an EV, the benefits you get are vast. Uh, you know, there's, there's some cities where you can't even drive and you can't even get a license for your car unless it's an EV because there's too many cars there. So if you buy an EV, that's the way you get a driver's, uh, that's the way you get a, a license Plate. plate. Plates. Yeah. Uh, they give big tax incentives, although they were cutting back on that. But still, they're going to build a lot of EVs. The question is, can they build any cars that are any good? I mean, Chinese cars historically have not been very good. But, you know, neither were Koreans uh, 20 years ago. Korean cars were terrible, and now they're world class. So they're near it. So I don't think we should underestimate the Chinese building up the capabilities of their auto industry, but focus solely on EVs. And then if you do that, you know, your point was you spend... 10, 20 million or 50 million on R&D, whether it's 100 vehicles or a million vehicles, it's better to do it with a million vehicles. So they can amortize all that R&D on a yeah. much bigger fleet than we can. And so I worry if, we're, if we start getting too far behind them, then you know, maybe they just have a good lead that's hard to beat. Yeah. So the markets that where EV acceptance is high and demand is increasing, obviously they have through economies of scale an opportunity to uh, to improve their costs more readily. And that could become a competitive advantage in pricing. Not to mention a lot of the raw materials are coming from China, which is, which is another issue entirely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we have to think also about the next generation of battery technology. And we have a partnership and an investment in QuantumScape looking at solid state batteries. And that may change some of these factors. Mm -hmm. Another thing we have to think about as we look at the, the prospect for EVs and AVs, et cetera, is just the, you know, the size of the US car park and the, and the convenience and attractiveness of the, co the conventional solution. Uh, you know, the fleet turns over slowly. Average age of cars is about 12 years in the United States. And even if we uh, switch immediately to selling 100% AVs and uh, EVs, uh, it would take uh, then 12 years to, let's say, replace the fleet. So uh, everybody needs to realize there's a lot of work to do and that the changes will be gradual uh, and require, let's say, a consistent or constant effort. The game is not over. Right. The game is not over. It's <laughs> early, early innings. Second yeah. inning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also want to, kind of going back to sort of R&D investment and trade, um, Thinking about our current environment, um, the current administration claims that, or has claimed that auto imports um, should be reduced to encourage additional R&D investment by domestic auto companies. And has implied that from only R&D from US auto companies contributes to US tech leadership and national defense. I have a feeling you guys probably disagree with this. Um, I would like you to sort of talk about, you know, is that true? And uh, do you think that reducing auto imports could actually result in greater R&D by US companies? Well, I, I can share with you from Toyota's perspective, we're in the midst of a five-year, $13 billion investment in the U.S. in upgrading our manufacturing plants and, and promoting more R&D here. And so as we talked to earlier, you know, the U.S. is the premier space for R&D. And by some accounts, non-Ford or GM companies now make up about 50% of the R&D that's being conducted here. Mm -hmm. So I think everyone is coming here to, to invest. Now, I can share with you our 1,800 researchers, engineers, and specialists we don't feel Japanese. <laughs> um, we are Americans. We feel that we work for a global company. So I think all companies are global now, and all of them are, are impacted by, by regulation and, and, and trade. And so I think we need to take a, a broader uh, perspective of some of these issues. 
Mm -hmm. I also think that the, I, the idea of R&D just being done in one facility is, is, uh, is not the way things are done anymore. Yeah. Uh, uh, with the introduction of information technology and the connections uh, companies could make globally, as, co as companies actually became global, it allowed them to do R&D. They'll have, uh, General Motors would have a, a research project that they would start in, uh, in the U.S. and it's then handed off to somebody uh, to the east and, and then farther out to, and to another country and hand it off as the, times cha as the time change uh, uh, went along. Uh, and this is something that all the manufacturers do. The inter their R&D facilities are interact uh, they're interconnected. So they're working on, they may all be working on the same project. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not like saying, oh, this is R&D is going to stay here. It doesn't stay here. It, it, it actually, it's all over the, and this is not just the auto manufacturers. The, the <coughs> auto suppliers do the same thing. So they have R&D plants, R&D uh, facilities throughout the world. And they're talking to each other about how they're working on different projects and connecting and wor working on those same projects. So to really to think that this is a uh, uniquely, oh, everything's just going to be done in this facility, I don't think that's the that's, uh, case anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I would just add that you know, we already heard about a number of examples where you know, Volkswagen is working with, what did you say, Ford or Ford? GM? Ford. Ford and yeah. Ford, yeah. And then, you know, I, I think I have another note here. I think Nissan and GM are working together. There's a lot of these partnerships. Honda, Honda and GM. Honda and GM, sorry, Honda thank GM. you. Um, which if you sort of said, well, only American, then, then you don't get that interchange of, of, of knowledge, which I think would hurt us. Um, there's a second problem with this whole view, which is uh, at a strategic level. Um, you know, when, and there's a little aphorism in real estate, it's location, 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 and trade, it is China, 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 cubed. I mean, that's it, okay? It's China. That's the threat, that's the trade challenge we have to face. And bringing in this other fight that we don't, I mean, it, it's sort of like, um, you know, fighting a 50-front war, which is no way we can win, and I'm not sure we're going to be able to win the China fight uh, because we haven't done enough to build up our allies. And, you know, sort of attacking the Japanese or the Koreans or the Germans or whatever in autos just diminishes our ability to form a united front against, to me, what is the real threat, uh, which, is, which is Chinese unfair technology competition. So I, I just think it's exactly the wrong direction to go. We should all be working together and, and you know, focusing more on, you know, I'll give you an example. In China, they had a policy that you got a subsidy for an EV um, as a driver, as a buyer, but, but your company couldn't qualify unless you gave China, the Chinese companies technology. So GM would have to give critical technology on, on electronic um, power controls and other things like that. And that's a total violation of the WTO rules. Total violation. You can't do that. And yet, they did it. So I think that's, you know, this is why I think going down this path is such a bad idea. Besides the fact that it wouldn't work anyway, it's just a bad high-level strategy. Uh, approach. There's just one thing to almost play devil's advocate against it. As I think about when I think about the auto industry today, I don't think GM, Ford, or Fiat Chrysler would be standing if they didn't sell their pickup trucks. I mean, that is where all the profit of these companies come from, and that is because of a chi the chicken tax. So there is a certain. I mean, I think that Americans really trust those. No offense against Toyota Tacoma or like that, but you know they have a very strong brand identity with those American trucks. So is there some? I don't know, logic or sort of validity to the point that, oh, well, you know, um, there is an element of protectionism that protects the truck market, which is where all the profits come from for GM, Ford, and Chrysler, which then they are using to invest in the future to the extent that they can, to a large degree, to keep the fires burning while they're preparing for the future. So, so again, the point I want to emphasize is, you know, Section 232 and the tariffs will impact all car companies. Uh, regardless of where the vehicles are made. Um, our, our Camry, uh, which is the number one selling sedan for 18 years in a row, and by some accounts is one of the most American-made products there is, price will go up by $1,500. And so if you look at that, you know, people have to understand how, how tariffs work. It, it's not a tax on the country of origin. Mm -hmm. it, it's a cost that either the manufacturer has to, you know, basically consume or pass on to the customer. Mm -hmm. Now, if the manufacturers consume that, then that erodes at our profitability, which means we have less to invest in R&D. Uh, if it's passed on to the consumer, that means, well, the consumer may hold on to that older vehicle a little bit longer. 
and they may not upgrade to a, a more safer, more fuel efficient vehicle. So that also has negative you know, connotations down the line. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think, again, we have to look at this as, as, a, as a tax, and it's really not good for anybody, because I think everybody will be impacted in some way. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the, uh, you know, w when you look at the, the, the truck market and the success that the domestically organized companies have had with it, it, uh, it it's it's uh, it, it's a impressive, and you know they they have a, they have strong brands, and they've done a great job in, in that segment of the market. And uh, at the same time, uh, all of the, all of the companies around the world operating in the U.S. have had the experience of the market shifting toward uh, the light truck segments, uh, you know, including SUVs as well as pickup trucks. So uh, you know we've we've made changes in our lineup uh, on all of our brands to participate in that part of the market. And with our scale, it doesn't make sense to, you know, try and become a, a you know, a, a, a big class pickup truck maker in the United States. Uh, and if, if the domestic companies are doing what you suggest, that is using the profits from that to invest in their future, well, that's, that's what they're supposed to do. And, uh, you know, uh, we could uh, attempt this uh, locally but on the other hand, they've got a very strong hold on that market, and unless you have the, the scale with which to approach it, it's, uh, it, it's a tough uh, uh, bite to take. And uh, so I, you know, they're doing the right thing with that, and at the same time, like us, they've got to balance their product portfolio to deal with all the compliance obligations and the customer tastes and all of that. So uh, it's, a, you know, it's a, it, it, it's a market that needs companies that focus in different areas, and uh, we all try to service it all if we can. Mm -hmm. But so, it doesn't mean that they can't do it, because you look at Toyota with, a, with their smaller pickup, they're the leaders in that, in that area. So, and SUVs. So this, is, so this was a, 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 a company that really said, okay, we're going to try to do battle with, with the big three on this story. And, and now in terms of full-size pickups, I don't think they're close. Mm -hmm. But in the, the mid-sized pickups, they're the leaders. Mm -hmm. So they found a niche, it, they worked it, and, and, and it has been successful for them. Mm -hmm. Nissan, not so much. Uh, they've, they've tried it as well and haven't been as successful. But it's kind of like, if you don't try, you'll never know. And, uh, in, you, it, well, then you start looking at what the U.S. companies are doing, where you have Ford saying, we're not really going to do pass cars anymore. You know, we're going to be a, a crossover SUV pickup truck company, which is a, a big, big disappointment in some ways because you go, God, this was, this was, this was they're, you're giving up a segment. You're actually giving up it in, in small cars and mid-sized cars mm -hmm. uh, in an area where they've actually had some success but they really didn't feel like they could make as much profit uh, as they could with, their, with the other vehicles. And uh, mm -hmm. in the long run, will, could, they transfer, could they move back if they wanted to? They're capable of doing it. Mm -hmm. It'll take them three to five years to do that. <laughs> They're more than capable of doing it. Mm -hmm. So what, are, what do you think, I mean, we may have covered this a bit already, but just to really focus on the point, I mean, what could the US do then to increase this R&D investment to make sure that we, if China is our big threat when it comes to you know, AVs, electrification, we've talked about all the conditions that are really positive here. If, if you know, reducing imports is not the answer, then what, you know, what, what would you really say we need to be? Well, one thing I think on? we could do, we, we do a report every two or three years called the State New Economy Index, and it's about 20, 30 indi 25 or 30 indicators. And one of the indicators is how much business or corporate R&D uh, is there in each state. And uh, as I recall, Michigan is number one or number two every year. You wouldn't think of it like Michigan. They're actually, it's because of what you're doing and what you're doing in GM, and it is a super high R&D state. So we have an R&D tax credit in the United States. It was set up in 1981, and in the, all the way through early Clinton years, it was the most generous research and development tax credit in the world. And now, according to the OECD data, we're probably 30th in the world. Uh, to get our credit to be in the top two or three countries in the world, we'd have to triple it. Uh, in fact, the last tax reform bill, which is, you know, generally did some good things, it weakened our R&D credit uh, if it doesn't get renewed in five years, whatever. 
So one thing we could simply do, Congress could say, instead of having a 14% alternative simplified credit for R&D, we go to 20% or 25%. That's one thing. Second thing is uh, a lot of countries have these industry university cooperative research center programs uh, where the government kicks in some money. Uh, we could do that in a bunch of areas that are super important. We have one in Michigan now called for lightweight materials that uh, I believe DOE is funded through the Manufacturing USA Institute. There's no reason we couldn't be funding four or five of those related to this specialized area, get the car companies, both foreign and domestic, to commit time, money, and resources, put it at places like Ann Arbor or you know, Michigan State or whatever. Uh, those are things we could do. We just have to have the political will decide that we want to win enough to make those prioritizations in our budget. And from an R&D perspective, um, I think it would be helpful if we had regulation, clarity, and consistency. So I know our, our friends in the White House have been doing a lot to create guidelines, uh, but what we really need is a clear pathway for deployment and commercialization. Um, this includes you know, changing some of the, the, the safety requirements that need to be updated to allow for kind of mass commercialization of some of these technologies. Uh, so we'd support some type of federal bill along those lines. And this would also support with the consistency side. Um, right now, under the current guidelines, state by state, they can create their own policy and their own rules, which is certainly going to negatively impact and slow down deployment. Uh, so again, we'd support some, some clarity and consistency you know, with mm -hmm. uh, a clear pathway for deployment. And are you all optimistic that we'll see that soon? I mean, I, I think they tried last year. Um, and I just want to throw out a fact, too, as we think about this. Um, I was reading about China's autonomous vehicle industry, and we're kind of trying to figure out where they really do stand you know, as they're prepared for this. And the government has a goal that 10% of new vehicles will be on 10% uh, of new vehicles will be autonomous by 2030. That's what their, you know, that's what their target is. So, where do you think the U.S. will be at that point? And side note, are you optimistic that we will reach that kind of across the board federal level regulatory framework that will allow us to keep moving forward to compete with that? So so a long, I think for, um, permanent framework will take some time, but uh, again, a bill is something that could be done quickly and I think more readily. But you know, looking at China, I think it really depends on how they're defining automated vehicle. Is it level two or level three? I mean, that, that could be in the near future. Certainly level four in certain geofenced areas uh, is, is probably realistic. Level five, I don't think so much. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, there's a big difference between ready and almost ready, and, and uh, it's, it's that last mile that you need to really focus on. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, I really think it depends on how they're defining autonomous. I think that uh, to some extent, you know, a, a, a quickly resolved and perfect regulatory framework would help us. But there are a lot of other limiting factors that will control the pace of the introduction of the technology. And so uh, this thing that we were discussing earlier about the need for engagement of all the stakeholders and acceptance and understanding of the technology, uh, therefore creating demand for the technology, will influence the pace as much as the regulatory framework. And I think the most important thing is that everybody wants to do it right, and we don't need to have a, you know, a, a, a hard and fast deadline to achieve a certain percentage. We need to have goals, and we need to keep moving. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to make sure that when the benefits are ready to be made available to, to the public, that the public gets the benefits of this technology. But I think we all want to be careful and do it right because it's complex and uh, there are a lot of ins and outs still to be discovered and managed. So I, I think the, the idea of a hard and fast uh, time frame uh, is, is one that we need to, let's say, build rather than state at this point. Mm -hmm. I, th I, th I think he made the really good point earlier about the how long it takes to turn over the fleet. When you think about how long it takes to uh, it, when you have 280 million vehicles on the road mm -hmm. and how quickly we did some research on this and, and he made the point of, well, if you had every, every vehicle sold this year was going to be electric vehicle, it would take maybe 12 years. But that's not the case. And so if you think you're, huh, and that's probably never going to be the case. Uh, so if you talk, up, talk about a gradual increase, you're talking about the turnover being 50 years. Like decades, decades. I probably won't see it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how long it's going to take before you have either all autonomous vehicles or all electric vehicles on the road. It's going to take a really long time. 
uh, just because, and in, during that time, it's going to be this combination of people who are driving regular cars, internal combustion cars, or non-autonomous vehicles. And this is going to be a challenge of, of how do you manage the transition. And it's going to be a slow transition because it has to be, be built on consumer acceptance. They're the ones who are going to have to say, I want these vehicles. And if, they, if they're not buying them at the, at the numbers that you expect, it takes even longer to make the changes. But then you, on the roads, you're going to have these, these difficulties. We have a, a, a driverless shuttle at, at the U of M, and it drives around in a parking lot. And it drives so slowly <laughs> that people drive around it, including myself. <laughs> I did it just the other day. It was driving like five miles an hour. I mean, I don't drive five miles an hour. And it's just dry, it's driving really slowly. And then this other thing that's happened, and I, it came out at a conference that we had last week, where we had the, person, the people who are at M-City who are running the, the shuttle, and they said, in the parking lot, when people see the uh, driver of the shuttle come to a stop sign, they know it's gonna stop. The people on the other side who have a stop sign, they run the stop sign. Interesting. And they just keep going because they know it's gonna stop. And so this was, I, I, I didn't, I, it didn't, I never hit me that this was how big a challenge it's this was going to be. It's going to exacerbate human behavior. And basically. look what happens when it get on the road that way. And people see it, oh, that's how Tom's feel. That, was, that, that car is going to automatically stop. I'm going to run this leg. <laughs> I think a lot of this debate really misses the major. Everybody's like level five, man, wait till we get to level five. You know, we did a study a few years ago for the Milken Institute uh, magazine, and we looked at the benefits of, if we get to sort of 3.75, <laughs> you know, whatever you want to call that or what it looks like, uh, and we get to 90% penetration, which we said would be by 2040, a uh, trillion dollars a year annual savings and benefits in the U.S. economy. But about 85% of that don't come from getting rid of drivers. They come from two big things. One, fewer crashes. You think about the biggest job impact of autonomous vehicles. It's not going to be taxi drivers. It's going to be auto body repair shops. That's where the jobs are going to lose. I just, some guy backed into, and we parked, my wife was parked, and he, he you know, ran into her like seven, seven miles an hour, but he broke the back. We had to take it in, you know, 1,200 bucks, whatever, insurance covered. You're not going to have those anymore. And you don't two, need, all, you don't two, need. Two million vehicles, two million accidents a year. Yeah, you don't need level <laughs> five. So you get all those savings, you get all the medical savings of, of hospitals or rehab, all of that. And then the other big saving you have is with level 3.75 or 4, you can drive much more closely on the freeway. So you can really dramatically improve throughput on 495 or 66 or whatever coming in in the morning. And so the congestion reduction in the U.S. from getting there. But again, you don't need to be able to have a car where you can fall asleep in the back seat and say, take me to work to get up. That'd be nice to get there. But we shouldn't lose sight of that. We're going to get a lot of benefits just by moving a little bit better. I mean, I, I ride my bike to work and not to, anyway, uh, last year I was riding in front of the White House, near the White House, and, and an Uber driver comes around and it hits me. Uh, you know, totally his fault. Total clueless guy. I mean, it can happen anytime. I get it. Uh, but, you know, a level three and a half, mm -hmm. 3.7, it would have put the brakes on. Yep. I would not have been hit. And we're not that far away from that, that kind of technology. And, and that's a good point. That's why Toyota has a dual-pronged approach. We have Guardian, which is you know, um, uh, level two, level three, where you know, the, the driver, the human, is actually in charge, but the vehicle will step in and, and provide that support. And the benefit of developing these technologies is we can pull them into today's, today's vehicles and start preventing accidents and saving lives yeah. sooner. Yeah. Uh, so I agree. There's no need to wait for level five. We can learn from these and apply to today's vehicles. Agreed. Yeah. And I think that's what the, the White House was talking about in terms of the ADAS mm -hmm. policies. Yep. These are really just advanced safety technologies that are going to be part of autonomous vehicles and therefore de de developing them and getting them into vehicles will have be a, a very positive mm -hmm. step. So on, on the topic of setting targets on an arbitrary date, our general take is that, you know, federal government's role should be to set an environment or develop an environment where innovations can thrive and while ensuring safety. Um, you know, the adoption of these uh, technologies, you know, depends on a lot of things, you know, market readiness, product readiness, consumer acceptance, mm -hmm. uh, which is outside the control of the federal government. Mm -hmm. That depends on consumer acceptance, the growth of the technology, and uh, who has the magic pill to solve the, mm -hmm. the problem. 
So, and it is a very hard problem. I mean, a lot of the things you see right now are level one, level two systems. And, you know, a lot of the companies are trying to get to level four. And level five is almost, you know, it's a very hard challenge. Mm -hmm. So it, it's going to take a long time. And our, our position is that we want to create an environment where um, innovators can innovate while they ensure safety. I think <clears throat> we've gotten to the Q&A part of our program. So if there are any questions from the audience, we'll be happy to take them. Mm -hmm. There's someone with a microphone right there. Uh, Richard Coleman, I'm retired from Customs and Border Protection. Uh, this was an HBO program, and I was just curious about it, not picking on Volkswagen. I used to have one that lasted 30 years until it was hit by a DC uh, taxi. Um, but they had a fatality uh, and the fact in the factory in, in, in uh, Wilkesburg, Wilkesburg um, uh, um, a robot crushed a worker. And this was, they were talking about Isaac Asimov's rules for robots. And I'm assuming an, an autonomous car would, be, would qualify as a robot, uh, that they have to listen to human beings. And rule number two was they could never hurt a human being. So this was the represented a violation of, of that. And I'm just wondering uh, what happened with, with that. I know they don't put the robot on trial. <laughs> uh, what actually did Volkswagen learn from it? What were the technical changes that resulted from it? And how did that, uh, how was that handled psychologically to have a, be working in a, in a factory where, around a machine that actually killed a fellow worker? I'm not sufficiently familiar with the case to answer your question in detail. I can say that uh, obviously any, uh, not obviously, certainly any fatality, whether in a factory or on the road, is unacceptable, and companies uh, need to be uh, obviously vigilant about these things and take steps to try and prevent them ever happening. So safety is foremost in our, in our factories, and we have a robust uh, dialogue with our workforce ar around these kinds of issues. So I'm sorry that doesn't answer your question, but uh, there's no doubt that uh, such things uh, of all kinds must be taken very seriously and addressed. You, sir. Uh, the guy in the white shirt. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm Dave Rubinowitz. I'm retired. Uh, the average American car today spends at least 95% of its time just sitting. And in a place like this area here, the people who own it are spending a fortune, just, in many cases, just for the ground that it's sitting on. A uh, car is a very expensive uh, piece of equipment to leave sitting around a lot. And it's getting to the point where uh, millennium, millennials are not even bothering to get a driver's license because it's cheaper to take an Uber than to pay for parking. And when Uber becomes autonomous, it's going to become that much cheaper. And my question is, is there really going to be a mass market for personal cars in the future? Well, that's a very good question because it's, it's an, uh, a, a premise that we were looking at in terms of a, a, a book that we're looking at writing. Where we have researchers in, in Europe and in, and in China and in the U.S. and talking about what happens if, what would society be like if all vehicles were autonomous and shared? And so, meaning that you're no, there was no ownership. You were just, the things would just pick you up. You would, you would have an app or gosh knows, I mean, who knows when that's going. I mean, we're looking at, you know, 50 years, you know, something like this. You and I won't see it, you know, right? <laughs> so, but it, it, it's interesting to think about how society would be affected by this. You know, would it mean, obviously there'd be fewer accidents. People would not be running into each other. Would there be more congestion or less congestion? Uh, but if people were sharing rides versus individual, if every person's in one vehicle, all of a sudden now you're just talking about people driving one vehicle around, right? It's just one vehicle. Uh, just because there's only that ownership, somebody would own that vehicle. It would be a, an Uber type or maybe General Motors would own it, you know. Uh, but it's a very interesting uh, uh, strategy and way of thinking about what the future might, like, like, might, might be. I think one of the mistakes people make in that scenario is they think, oh, you know, GM, Volkswagen, Toyota, there's not going to be a market anymore because, you know, instead of having one car, ten cars, you'll have one car. Think about why somebody gets rid of an old car. Uh, I got rid of my old Toyota. 
And the reason I did was my son was learning how to drive and I wanted a car that had better airbags and mm -hmm. it was like you know, 15 years old. It mm -hmm. worked for me, I hardly ever drive. Mm -hmm. So I had to upgrade. So people will still upgrade, that's number one. Number two is uh, people will do it because there's body damage or you know, there's just, just the thing wears out just because of age. So that won't change. Uh, I mean, that, 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 that will be, but the main reason people get rid of cars is because of mechanical wear and tear. And so if you have a car that's being driven 14 hours a day, it's not gonna last very long. I mean, it's not gonna last 20 years. It might last five years. Because mm -hmm. the engine, all the drivetrain, you know, those things are as good as Toyota and Volkswagen, all these cars are in the old days. You know, if you, if you got 100,000 on a car, you'd be super happy. But you don't get a million. I mean, maybe you do on a couple. We, we did. We have a Tundra. <laughs> we have a Tundra with a million miles. <laughs> That's right. apart, Very so. few. <laughs> yeah. At some point, you know, you just, so I, I don't think we're going to be in a world where the car companies aren't making lots and lots of cars. I would say, uh, if I could just add one yeah. note, we're actually experimenting with these kinds of new ownership models ourselves. So at, at Audi, we've got a, a program called Audi Select where you can essentially buy a subscription to a car and the car can be used by others while you're not using it. So uh, we don't want to discourage people from running out and buying and owning a car and keeping it. But on the other hand, uh, we need to be familiar with these new modes in the future. And of course, geography makes a big difference, cities, country, et cetera. So all this has to evolve and we, we'll adapt to it. You had a question. So kind of the elephant in the room with all of these uh Hey, so kind of the elephant in the room with all of these, this whole discussion is the impact on the labor force and the broader economy. Um, in the, like the, the DOT report 3.0, there was literally a line on it, like we advise states to retrain uh, transportation workers in high skill industries. And I mean, someone here commented that, I mean, it's not just driving, it's not just a driver, it's the entire warehouses, it's all of the logistics end of it. Once it's automated, it's going to be gas stations and ba basically the entire, I mean, industrial machinery. Is the industry really thinking about political vulnerabilities here? Um, and where could those come from? If they take over like a state called, like Utah, could they, did, it, could a legislature in Utah make it impossible to drive the I-80 or the I-15? Um, or county, or like where is the industry thinking about this and where could they come from? And secondly, insur uh, like liability and insurance, uh, where is the industry and regulations um, and looking forward toward these sorts of things? Thank you. So on the workforce component, um, so DOT is doing a report with the Department of Labor, Commerce, and HHS on this topic, on workforce impacts uh, to drivers who uh, drive for a living. Um, so the report is uh, going to be published sometime in the near future, but uh, we are collaborating with these two a uh, four agencies, uh, three other agencies, to look at various scenarios of future business models and uh, different uh, use cases and uh, kind of looking at the economic models on how that impacts the drivers itself. So uh, we are doing a research project on that particular topic because it is, it is a topic of concern. And uh, Toyota is part of an organization called the Michigan Alliance for Greater Mobility Advancement, which is a consortia of the state of Michigan, uh, local universities and community colleges, as well as uh, industry, uh, General Motors, Ford, Fiat, Chrysler, Toyota, and Nissan. And we're looking at the emerging technologies and what impact that will have on jobs, what new jobs will be created, what jobs could be displaced, and more importantly, what type of training do the community colleges and universities need to start providing uh, to prepare a uh, future workforce uh, for these emerging trends. Um, additionally, I think as we start looking at some of these technologies, um, you know, we're already starting to adopt these technologies. You know, our manufacturing plants, we're applying um, big data. We, we, we have radio um, frequency modules on all of our, our key equipment that we're collecting data 24-7 so we can understand what equipment's going out of control and, and prevent significant downtime. Um, we're deploying machine learning. We have uh, visual recognition systems that check badging and wheels and, and uh, lamps to make sure that they're great and, and in position. And, and if there's a shadow or a vibration, these systems are triggered and they go offline so they have to be rebooted. But now we're teaching them to learn on their own so they can differentiate between shadows and vibrations. So all of these technologies are already being deployed in the manufacturing process. And what we're learning through that is it takes a different skill set. Instead of the worker physically doing, now the worker needs to physically maintain or troubleshoot 
uh, some of these equipment. So it is going to be a transition, and I think we're working now with you know our suppliers, with our, our workers, um, and with industry to, to define you know wh where is this all headed. In our company, the workforce is a key partner in the governance of the company, and uh, for us. Uh, the, the responsibility is to make sure that the company is successful and at the same time as the business evolves we've got to uh, make available and drive the kind of training uh, that uh, 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 Jeff has referred to in order to make sure that our workforce is ready for all the changes that come so it's a it's a question of uh, let's say uh, addressing the needs of all the stakeholders uh, most importantly including the workforce going forward uh, gentleman against the left wall back there. Thank you. Henry Rademacher, Americans for Tax Reform. My question is, um, the past week we saw a lot of strikers from the GM plant, I forget the state, and I understand the statistical models and the studies saying that automation is going to have a net positive impact on the economy. But when you have an employee that doesn't have a college education, I, my question is, ha where are the jobs going to be for those people going forward? Well, I think this is an area where there's, you know, 10 times more hype and misunderstanding and obfuscation than there is reality. Uh, if you look at the studies, either by us or by OECD or by the White, Obama White House, they did a study on this. Uh, the Oxford guys uh, did the study on this. Uh, what you find is that most of the job impact in this space are going to be at low income jobs. Uh, and right now, between 15 to 22 percent of American workers are overskilled. So there's a lot of Americans working at Starbucks who, you know, or whatever, you know. And so I, th I think the key really is, num number one, you know, we, we have this view that, oh my God, the worst thing in the world we could do was ever eliminate a job. I mean, if we had that view when we were in the 1800s, we would all still be working on farms. You know, I'm really, really grateful that my, my, our predecessors did not uh, say, oh my God, we can't have, tr we're gonna ban tractors. So you look at San Francisco, for example, they banned sidewalk delivery robots, which by the way, an autonomous vehicle. Oh, we don't, we don't want to, we, we, you know, it's such a great job delivering pizza. It's like one of the greatest jobs you can ever have. So I think we have to, number one, understand that we really have a national productivity imperative. The U.S. productivity is at the lowest rates of growth probably in our history. We've got 10,000 people retiring every day. If we don't figure out a way to improve factory productivity, auto productivity, et cetera, we're not going to be able to really thrive in the future. That's number one. Number two, this is going to be a lot slower than people think. A lot slower than people think. And you know, we're not going to get fully autonomous trucks driving all the way across the country into New York City overnight. I mean, if I just am a trucker and I just bought a $300,000 cab, or I don't know how much they cost, I'm not throwing it away next year because I can switch to an autonomous. I'm going to depreciate it. So it's going to take a long time. It'll phase in. And we, we, we're not going to have to have, a, I think, this cataclysmic job loss. It's going to be gradual. And the key is what, what, what you said is you got, and what, you, what everybody said is basically you have to prepare now. You got to improve the policy programs and systems we have so that workers can get better skills uh, right now. And so we have, we, have, we have time, I won't say we have plenty of time, but we have time. And, and we aren't doing enough. Uh, absolutely the U.S. is not doing enough. Germany is doing a much better job in this space than the U.S. is. Singapore, Canada, France, you can go down the list. So as a you know, national government and state governments, we've got to do, they all have to do a better job, I would say. But the worst thing we can do would be to panic and say, let's slow it down. You're right there. Gentleman in the suit, the, right there. Yeah. Oh. oh. Uh, wanted to ask, it was a very interesting session, appreciate it, appreciate seeing a couple of our member customers uh, doing such interesting work. I wanted to ask about 5G versus 4G and what, what that means. Um, different countries are all over the lot. The U.S. hasn't really set any standards as, as I understand it at this point. We're kind of letting um, both systems evolve. Um, given the infrastructure constraints in this country, do we need to choose A and B? Is this an example of uh, some of the competitive challenges where a really entrepreneurial culture, the best in the world, 
does need some long range careful regulation. So, you know, we are a big proponent of DSRC because it's a proven and tested technology and we've been deploying it in Japan and, and you know, we'd like to, to deploy it here, like I said, mainly because it's proven. Um, the challenge is you, you need enough, um, you know, capital, uh, both from an infrastructure perspective as, as well as a, uh, an environmental movement to, to make it worthwhile. Um, now, certainly, you know, CVDX and, and, and 5G also has a lot of promise. Um, but whether or not, you know, how soon that will be ready, uh, we're not sure. You know, but the goal is how, how can we make these technologies interchangeable um, and aligned so that you don't have to, you're not forced to pick one way or another. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly I think there, there has to be much more discussion around this space. And we uh, agree in part and disagree in part with Jeff. My company is all over the lot uh, in a way. We, we have uh, uh, development on DSRC as well as on 5G applications. The most important thing for us, and I think we share this view with our friends at Toyota, is that the uh, uh, 5.9 gigahertz uh, spectrum needs to be preserved for this uh, automotive connectivity application, no matter what uh, uh, ultimate technology we use. Mm -hmm. So that's our near-term goal, and I think we're all working to support that. A uh, woman in the back. Thank you. Um, I'm Kelly Cox with ANSI, the American National Standards Institute. Really appreciated the uh, panel discussion. The technology is amazing. My question might be a little more personal than professional. What work is being done to win over the public support for all of this cool technology? Like I just came from the AI Summit um, and then we host an event on unmanned vehicles last week. So the technology is there. So how do we get the public adoption piece? I'm wondering what work is being done in that area. So I can talk on behalf of DOT. Uh, so one of the things DOT um, has done um, in ABS uh, 2019 in Orlando is we brought together all the stakeholders um, who are automated uh, driving system developers, OEMs, and certain suppliers who actually do the automated driving systems as well. And uh, we wanted to have a discussion on, you know, communicating the capabilities and limitations of the technology so that consumer acceptance actually gains. Um, so similarly, we had Pay Coalition, SAE, Consumer Reports. So all the, all the folks were actually working on this. Because one of the key things is if you want to really ensure safety, there needs to be consumer acceptance. Uh, so how can we do a clear job of explaining the capabilities and limitations of these systems? So we are actively uh, looking at how to go forward on public education side, but we're working very closely with PAVE and AAA um, and SAE and other organizations like that to make sure uh, you know, the, the public understands the capabilities and limitations of uh, automation technologies. Okay. <laughs> um, Sarda, do you have one still or no? Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am? I wanted to follow up his question about, oh. um, I wanted to follow up the question on um, uh, preparation, for instance, we're having a big debate about uh, how much per hour a person will make. And um, we're very, we're emphasizing technology a great deal and STEM classes. Um, how will our current, say, high school uh, students going into college face the future in technology assembly lines, what you are suggesting? Um, will they see it as a good career or lower class, lower income, blue collar, and I want something bigger and better? How are you going to approach that image? At, at our, um, uh, we, we agree this is an important challenge because we need to attract people into the manufacturing sector in the future. At our company in Chattanooga, where we have our U.S. factory, we have brought a version of the German apprenticeship system into the plant. And we have partnerships with the local high schools supported by the uh, state community college system that actually has a, an apprentice program in the plant where high school students work some of the time and attend classes some of the time. And they learn about future technologies like electric vehicles, working around batteries and electric cars. 
And the manufacturing environment is a high-tech environment. They're essentially you know, managing machines and managing computers as well as manipulating parts and the cars. So it is a high-tech, uh, desirable, uh, let's say attractive kind of occupation that not enough people know about, uh, but they also need training for. So we're trying to tackle those things together. And frankly, I think that that sort of model has worked well and there are others, but we have a need and uh, as, as we continue to grow our business in the U.S., we have to continue also to support programs that invest in the workforce. And I, I just want to add real quickly, um, you're absolutely right. I think the brand image of the auto industry really took a hit during the 2009 recession and, and, and some of the bankruptcies and such. And so we have a lot of work to do to, to kind of change the, the, the brand image of the auto industry. And we're doing very similar. We have something called the Advanced Manufacturing Technician, which is now part of, of FAME, a large organization that's going nationally where I mean, we start recruiting students in, in middle school to, to come and visit the plants with their teachers and their parents. Uh, to see what a career in manufacturing really looks like. And, and very similar, um, they go off to a community college uh, for a two-year degree. Um, it's a kind of work school share. They work Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They go to school Tuesdays and Thursdays. It, it's an amazing curriculum that we put them through. Every semester that they advance, they get a pay raise. So by the time they graduate, they're ready to engage as, as a you know, manufacturing uh, skilled trades uh, member. Uh, but it's really a fantastic program. I, I encourage you to and to, to Google it or look it up or see me afterwards, I'd be happy to talk more about that with you. Okay, I think, oh, yes, Bill. This is an opportunity for commercial. <laughs> which I can't resist. The Scholl Chair just issued a paper in July on. We just issued a paper in July on exactly that question. So if you're interested in worker training in advanced manufacturing, go to our website and you can see it. Uh, equally important, on October 4th, we're going to be putting out another one on how to better match workers and job seekers, I mean employers and job seekers, and how to make sure that we get right skilling to address partly the question that, that you were asking. What do we do about people who are having trouble finding the jobs because their skills don't match the jobs that are available, or at least they think they don't? Uh, and that's going to be a very interesting report that will probably be enlightening as well. Are there more questions? Because if not, there is more questions. One more. Um, I'm just very interested in the international context here, especially with the emerging rivalry with China that seems to be not going away anytime soon, and the standards that are being developed over there, and our fear of their uh, expropriation of our 5G technologies, maybe, or, you know, they're ba basically advanced. And I want to see, um, you know, when we had the former rivalry with the Soviet Union, we had them producing Ladas and Skodas out of Czech Republic. Uh, do you see um, that kind of thing evolving, that kind of, you know, they have an industry and we have one, and which one's going to be on top? Mm. What was the last part? Yeah. The what? The Who's going to win this industry? Are we going to have an island? Oh, sure, sure. I think we're going to have partial decoupling no matter what happens. I just, uh, you know, the Chinese are pretty bent on going down a particular road. They, they don't seem to want to, you know, sort of come back to global, what you could call global, I don't even call it free trade, because nobody quite free trade, but normal trade. They just don't want to seem to come back to that. They're dead set on their agenda. Uh, and, you know, increasingly it's alienating a lot of countries. I mean, the German Big Business Association recently did a big report on that, calling out the Chinese. Um, so I think, you know, we're still going to, I think there'll still be trade. I don't think there's going to be complete decoupling, but, you know, increasingly you're seeing big increases in exports to the U.S. from places like Vietnam uh, because companies have moved production there. Um, so, you know, we're, they're not trying, the Huawei's not going to sell any 5G gear in the U.S. That's pretty, much pretty clear. Uh, so I think, you know, I, you know, I hate to say it because there was you know, this vision in the 2000s like, oh, we're going to move to this wonderful Tom Friedman world, and uh, <laughs> we're not. Uh, but it won't be a Soviet Union, Cold War, total. I mean, we sold them Pepsi, I think, and wheat, and that was about it. It's not going to be that, but it's not going to be the same kind of integration we have with Europe or Japan, in my view. Okay, well, yeah. Thank you very much for coming, and thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.